in here. Um, zoom is a little tricky to, 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 you know, to, to set up sometimes. Okay. It's already yep. here. Um, well, it's a long way. But I have a lot of questions for you and we're going to talk a little more about other stuff as well. So I have to start actually speaking in Portuguese because we're trying to record it straight to the channel. Right, and, okay. And, and then we're, we're going to introduce, you don't need no introduction, but we're going to introduce everything again. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay, I'm going to start. One, two, three, let's go. Fala, galera. Que é o Luan, do blog Everton FC Brasil. E, e é um prazer para a gente hoje receber essa grande lenda do Everton, que é o Mr. Neville Southall, para falar com a gente, bater um papo, é, trocar ideias, enfim. Vai ser, um, vai ser um momento muito interessante e histórico aqui para a gente do blog. E vamos aproveitar né, esse momento. Vamos lá. Hello, Nev. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank, thank you for having us. Uh, so, Nev, as you know, we are a blog about Everton for over a decade now, 13 years, and we actually spoke to you some time ago. I don't know if you remember that, but we did an interview via email. So this time right. is even greater that we are actually talking to each other. It's nice this, nicer this way. Yeah, <laughs> much nicer. And Nev, let me start asking you about your current projects. So you are very active on social media, right? And you have different actions over there as well, especially on Twitter. Some people access your profile and they share some of the experiences, right? Some other stuff not re directly related to you. And you have just released a book, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd like to, to ask you to talk a little bit about your current life, what you are doing these days, especially now with the pandemic. Well, I, I work in a special school, which is a school, I'm sure you have them in Brazil, which when the children don't get on with mainstream school, uh, mainstream education, they come to us. Um, yeah. Supposed to be six weeks, but mainly they, they stay with us. Uh, either their behavior or they have some mental health problems, or maybe they just don't get on with four walls in the school. They don't, they come to us. We have small classes. Um, I do that five days a week. And then my other social media stuff is basically uh, when, I, when I knew there was a lad kind of come out to be gay in school I had no idea what to talk to him about so I, I went on Twitter and asked a few questions of the LGBT community and they gave me some really good advice and then I thought well if I don't know anything then there's other people who don't know anything about being gay or, or lesbian or whatever then I invited him on to come and talk on my Twitter and that's really how it started so I've had it and more or less everybody on I can think of um, some people have turned me down because they don't, they don't think it's the right thing for them to do. But in the main, people have been quite good about it. And for me, it's an education because I don't know anything. So it's good for me to learn. Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we, we kind of have this sort of special school, but here in Brazil, it, we are actually in the midst of a crazy government. So yeah, I know. Uh, the people, the people that, the educators that, um, you know, planned this whole, this whole system for education for special people, they actually started doing mixed classes. So there wasn't um, any special schools these days. So the people who had any kind of uh, uh, deficiency, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's how you say in English, uh, they, they joined classes with other people as well so there's no there was no um, difference between that 
but now we don't know if they're going to change it um, for the next years because that's something that the government slightly mentioned um, some months ago. So we have so much trouble that we don't know exactly which controversy from the government we have to address first, you know? I know that they're not very good on LGBT, are they? They're not very good on that on that sort of thing. So I, I know that. I know I know that you have a beautiful country that's football mad. And you would have thought that sport would play a massive part in all education. Because that that really is a way to get to rid of, you know, get to get some of the troubled children back playing football and educating them through football really and, and through sport. What we try to do in our school is we do the same lessons as every other school. They do the same qualifications. You know, physically, there's there's nothing wrong with them, really. Um, so it's only really that they need a bit more care and they need a bit more attention and they might have, you know, they might be a little bit autistic or, or things like that. So I, I can understand that everybody wants them to mix, but for some children, mixing with others is not good for them. So, so some of them need... Small classes, some of them can survive in big classes, some of them can survive in big schools, but some can't, and some then come to us because they like the intimacy of we have a maximum of six to eight in a class, and that, that's all. So, and we have a teacher and a teaching assistant, so we have two to, two to eight, and it's really, really good. And they get the attention and they get the, the education that they need rather than be lost in a a 12 or 1500 pupil school. Yeah, so here it's a little different. Um, we have some teaching assistants as well. And that's interesting to have this exchange right now. I, I'm an educator as well. I'm actually an right. English teacher. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So in some of my classes that are, that are people with autism and, you know, we are we are the characteristics or but we 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 try to to handle that as well we 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 are still trying to find because that's actually a a continuous process right so yeah you always have to to find ways to make the children and the teenagers welcome in the best way with these kinds of situations nev uh, let me ask you about this point you mentioned um, regarding football and society. So for you, do you think that the football community has improved in a way that footballers can express themselves and their points of view? How is that for you? How was that for you when you were a player and how you see uh, these kinds of things now? I, I think when I was a player, Nobody bothered too much what we said because, you know, there wasn't the media that there is now. There wasn't the technology that there is now. It's not 24-hour-a-day news or there wasn't then. Uh, these days, I think it's really, really hard because, you know, like you know when you try to do an interview with a player now, they have the press officer sat next to them so they don't say anything wrong. We sort of uh, pushed our players into a position where they can't say what they really want to say. And I think Marcus Rashford has probably broke the mould on that. And he's come out and he's, he's done some great work. And I, and I think most of the players want to do it, but, but I think the clubs are reluctant for them to get involved in anything else apart from football. And you know that, for instance, if Pele says something in Brazil, everybody takes notice of it. So, you know, sports people are, are powerful. And they're powerful to children and they're powerful to adults. Unfortunately, the in this day and age, whenever they say something, it depends on which media picks it up and what their own agenda is. Because in our country, we have a, a Tory-owned media, really. So anything against the Tories is not well received. And I think Marcus has done exceptionally well. I think he's been exceptionally brave and come out and made some statements. We still don't want our players to, to say too much and most players, uh, well, most people in, in, in my country, if nobody disagrees with me so, sometimes, and they, or somebody does, sorry, all they say is, yeah, but what do you know? You're an ex-footballer. You just used to kick a ball around. And they, they just have this perception of somebody running up down the pitch, 
he was incredibly stupid. Uh, and then they finished their career and the owner, the owner pub or an inn, and, and they get drunk a lot and gamble a lot and then they die. And that, that was a, a sort of, I suppose, image of a footballer. Yeah, it's like a predicted fate for footballers, right? And... Yeah, I, so I, I think for now, now it's changed because yeah. there's so many different nationalities in the Premier League. It's brought you know a bit more cosmopolitan feel to it. Um, and if somebody outside of Britain says something there, or outside of British players says something, then, it, then it's better received than, than the British players a lot of the time. Um, whether we just think that because all players come from a working class background in Britain, really, that they don't have the same opinions as somebody who's come from abroad. It's a, it's a strange media hours where they love you for 30 seconds and hate you for years. Yeah, and if, do you think that Everton played a part for you in order... I know you were already a grown man um, when you started playing for Everton, but Everton, at least the way we see the club here in Brazil, it, it is a club that is actually involved in politics, but in different ways, not exactly relating to Tories or Labour, but in real actions. Also with Everton, the community and different attitudes from, from the club. But you, we can see also his Charlison's. Is it okay? No? Yeah. Turn that off. I'm yeah, I can wait. Then I, I will wait. So I'll just leave the message. Don't worry. Sorry. So you you said Richarlison, yeah. So let me let me get back. Uh, so do you think um, playing for Everton uh, had a part in your political consciousness? Because we know you were a grown man when you joined the club, but we see Everton. Uh, with this sort of political involvement, not exactly about uh, the election dynamics between Labour and Tories, but, you know, in making real statements and real actions for their community. And we can also notice that Richarlison, for instance, he started engaging more in some, some issues that are happening here in Brazil. He's, he's talking a lot about that uh, on Twitter, and he's also helping some researchers regarding health health vaccines. So, do you think do you think that playing for Everton uh, also leads you to to have this better consciousness about politics and and society in general, or or is it this is something that it's totally different for every single player? I think if you live in Liverpool, then it's a political city. I think I think you you can't help get involved in in the people's troubles if you like. And I think the community side of having a football club do an exceptional job. But there wouldn't be a community side of the club if things were going well politically and in society. And I, and I think the clubs have grown up knowing where to fill the gaps that probably whichever government is in power, they've, they're filling the gaps, you know, where they need to. And I think Evan Community is probably the best in the world at what he does. And, and it's, you know, it's a truly remarkable thing. And when they get the new mental health building, it's going to be even better. And I think with Richarlison, because when he came to Everton, well, nobody in this country knew much about him, really. You know, he wasn't in the Brazil squad, I don't think. So... Yeah. By playing as well as what he did for Everton and then getting into the Brazilian squad, his confidence has grown and grown. He's become a little bit more mature. And I think that confidence has shown then that he feels he's able to speak about his country and he's able to get involved in things back home. I think it's sometimes it's, it's awfully difficult as well when, you know, obviously you live in Brazil and I live over here. I would probably find, I find it quite easy here to talk politically. But maybe as a player, I would struggle. If I was away from my country, playing for somebody else, maybe Germany or France or even Brazil, then I, I, I would probably find it a little bit easier because of the distance and there's, there's less pressure on me from the, the local press and the local media. So I think there's a combination of things that's with Jarlison, to be fair. One, I think 
he's grown up as a man because when he first came, he did fall over a lot. You know, every time he got tossed, he went to ground and I think he's got better at staying on his feet and, you know, he's made some mad tackles as you could see Saturday, he made a mad tackle. We're going to but, talk but about I, that later because it's been a yeah. crazy yeah, it has. meltdown. But I, I think he's done, he's matured as a player and as a man. So, and I think he's took more responsibility on, some responsibility on. And I think now we're not getting into the Brazil squad. I think sometimes when you're away from your country, it gives you an opportunity to look, look back. And, and if you like, you're not into, you're not in the forest. You're outside of the forest looking in, where if you're inside the forest, it's really difficult to see things. So I think coming out of the forest really and coming out of the country is, has made it probably a little bit easier for him to actually see things in, in a clearer way. And I think everybody needs a little bit of space and time sometimes and maybe come into heaven and give him that time and space to look back and hopefully he'll do some amazing work for, for Brazil and, and for Everton. That's right. Nev, uh, you have just released a new book called Mind Games, The Ups and Downs of Life in Football. Um, can you tell us a little more about why you wrote it and, and what is it about? We know that it touches, it touches on mental health, but what, what more you can say, uh, say to us about this book? Well, first of all, it's not a football book. I've done my autobiography and Harper Collins, the publishers came to me and said, look, we like what you do on social media. Can we do a book based around social media? but including your experiences within in football. So, yeah, I've touched on mental health. I've done racism. I've done um, LGBT stuff. I've done confidence. I've done lots of different topics, and I wanted to put them all together in a book, really, because it's not it's not really a... a it's a book of my thoughts, really, on, a, on every subject. You know, I, I do some work with the um, show Racism Red Card in this country, so I wanted to push that. I do some work on LGBT. I do, I've mentioned sex workers in there. So I, I do all sorts of topics on Twitter and we wanted that to come through in a book. So yes, we do do an awful lot of mental health in there, but it, it's in a way that we, well, I hope will help people using the same things that I use before the games, during the games, after the games. So it's along them lines, really. <clears throat> but don't be expecting any football stories in it because there's none. It, 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 it doesn't mean you can't relate to the sports, right? Because that the psychological aspect is, is yes. essential for playing, even for supporting. Yeah. Well, an open mind is. I think an open mind is the, most, the best thing you could ever have. When you walk into the ground, then whatever the opposition is, it's just the opposition. You don't have to be racist. You don't have to be homophobic. You just have to appreciate and respect the opposition. And I think I wanted to push that across because, you know, when people are homophobic or racist to the opposition, well, they're doing it to our players as well. And they're doing it to our fans as well because we've all got gay mates and, and we've all got black people that, you know, that are playing for the team. So at the same time, when people are homophobic and racist towards the opposition, it, it, it's a reflection on who they are, not who the club is. And, I think we need to get a grip of the racism in, in, in football again and, and the homophobia. And I think it's it's coming back a little bit. There are reasons for that in our country um, because of the way the country's been divided by different politics and, and different influential people. But in the main, you know, it's crept into sport. Now, whether people are getting more frustrated and it's just coming out, I don't know. But we do need to do something and knock it on the end because at the end of the day, people are people. It doesn't matter where they come from or what colour they are, does it? It's... If he's your best player, he's your best player. I don't care whether they're purple, green or yellow, whether he got three heads. If he scores 20 goals a season, he's my man. I don't care. That's right. Nev, uh, is that okay for you to, to, to hold your cell phone? Yeah, close it better? to you, man. We need to see you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, I have a lot of questions here. So, I think we can start our Q&A right now. Right. Uh, like a proper Q and A. We're having this nice chat. That let's check <laughs> what the fans, the other fans, want to ask you. Uh, let's go. So first, we have four questions for the same people, the same person actually. Everton Cosme from 
Recife, Pernambuco, here in Brazil. His first question is, do you think that the, the signings of Richarlison, Bernard, and Alan uh, created this new era for the club in terms of believing more in Brazilian South American players, and especially international players? What do you think? Well, I don't think anybody has never not respected South American football. You've only got to watch it and watch Brazil play football. You know how good they are. You know how good the players are. Um, I think Bernard is taking a little bit of time to settle in. And maybe it's at the moment the physicality is stopping him playing to his full potential. Maybe when he gets a little bit stronger and he's earned a little bit more time, he'll be, he'll be okay. But but the others, yeah, the mentality is there. But I think that because the manager's come in and he's he's been able to get rid of a few people and he's set the philosophy of the club, which is we've never had a philosophy for the last 10 years. It's always been just to survive. He now has come in and he wants to win. You know, the club wants to win because we're going to move into a new stadium. If we don't, if we don't, if we move into that new stadium with a really poor team, we're not going to fill it. So commercially, it's going to be a failure. So if it's commercially a failure, that means that the manager won't be there anyway. So I think what they're trying to do is is build a, a team that's going to be competing in Europe by the time we get into the new ground. And I think the players he brought in have, have been great. I think the three of them that he's brought in in the summer have been great. We weren't that bad in all fairness, but our midfield was probably the weakest part of our team. We're always going to score a goal. We won't concede that many, but the middle bit of the of the, of the pitch is where people can get at the defence and where we haven't made enough chances for us. So I think he's addressed that fact, which I think is really, really good. If we can get another dominant centre-half, I'd be really pleased, and maybe another midfield player. I, I think that, and probably another striker, because we, you know, with Charleston is going to be get booked. Uh, Calvin Lewin's going to get booked. We, we need that third striker really, as somebody can come in and knock a few goals in while the other two are either suspended or injured. So, but I think overall, I, I think the, the players are, are bought into Ancelotti's philosophy, and I think because he's gone out to try and win things, and he's kept a, a, a settled side, I think it's been great for us. And I, I think the future's bright. That's right. Cosme's next question is about Pickford. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask. He has two related questions. So first, uh, what can Pickford do to become a safer goalkeeper? And do you think that there should be uh, more rotation between the keepers of the club, like one one keeper for? The cup games and the other one for the Premier League? Well, if we take the second point first, do you want to win the cup? Yep. Does everybody want Everton to win a trophy? Yeah. Right. So the reason that the other goalie's not playing in the team is because he's not as good as Pickford. So by putting Pickford and Pickford out of the team, do you think that's going to strengthen our team or make it weaker? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got, I got then, your point. I got your point. <laughs> so there's the answer on that. If he was a, if he was a, a 19 year old that you were trying to blood and really inexperienced, then I would say, yeah, I can understand maybe giving him a couple, couple of games in, in in that. But it's really important at this moment in time that Everton win a trophy. So you have to go with your best team, and I think he's the best goalkeeper at the club. So you have to play him. Also, being a goalkeeper, do you play sport? Um, I did a long time ago, not nowadays. Right, so it's easier if you're playing on a regular basis and you are getting to your groove and you know what you're doing. It's no good if every two weeks you're getting moved out of the team. So I think for the goalkeeper, you need to be have stability and need to know that you're going to play if your form's good enough. And I think stability is a good thing for, for, for Pickford. He's, he's playing regular. But what he needs to do is get better is just win the battle in his own head. Because over the last six months, he's probably had two bad minutes when you count up all the, 
all the seconds he's used up on making mistakes. It doesn't sound a lot, but two minutes has it, it, turned him from a really good goalkeeper in lots of people's eyes to, to a liability. But I'll, I'll ask the, this question to you. How many people are better than him? Who would you bring in and how much would they cost? And is it a real priority for Everton Football Club to buy a goalkeeper? No, it's not. We don't need to spend the money on a goalkeeper. He's England's goalkeeper. He's the best goalkeeper in England. He's, that's why he's playing. So, yes, I'm happy with he, he's there. Can he do better? Yes, he can do better. He, once he settles down, I think the, the biggest thing is his anticipation on build-up. So when the play is building up, I, I think he needs to switch on a little bit more and concentrate a little bit more. Because if he has three seconds to think, he's brilliant. He make ridiculous saves. If he has five minutes to think, then I think he's, his mind starts wandering. So I think for a goalkeeper, it's 90% mental and 10% physical. And I think at the moment, he just needs to concentrate a little bit more and just look at what he's doing. And I think sometimes he gets caught thinking about something else or it looks like. So I think the only battle he's got to win is the one in his head. Once he wins that, he'd be fine. And it, and it won't be a problem. He's not really a problem because he, even on Saturday, look, he made one bad tackle and the goal he let in was offside. And that was his bit of luck, I think. And I'm hoping that goal that he let in on the, the third goal, where everyone was going to criticise him, I'm hoping that because it got cancelled out, I think I'm hoping that's a bit of luck he needs to turn it round. But, you know, Ancelotti is a shrewd man. If your job's on the line and you think the man's a liability, he'll be out the door. So what people in Brazil have got to remember and all, all the Everton fans is that if Angelotti trusts him, then we've got to trust Angelotti to make the right decision because, like I say, if he's going to cost me my job, he's not going to be playing. And at the moment, he doesn't think that's going to happen. That's right. So talking about Angelotti... Here is Felipe's question. He's from Rio de Janeiro. Um, Ancelotti's arrival was something too risky that ended up uh, working out. Or do you think the the board had uh, a big plan, a, a solid plan for the next three years, which are the, the I think it's the contract of, of Carlo. I think we've had too many managers in a short space of time. And each one of them managers never came out and said they wanted to win anything. And I think as a fan, you want someone to come out and go, we're going to try and win this. If they don't, they don't. But I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that you want to win a trophy or that you want to win games. I hate people who come out and say, well, you know, we might do this, we might do that. No, no. We're going to try and do this and we're going to try and win the league. We're going to try and win all the cups. What is the point of being a footballer if you don't, if you don't want to try and win something? So I think Ancelotti's come in and he, he's got a, a winning mentality. He's got a winning history. And I think the club need him because it, it needs a different approach. You know, well, we've heard in the past that it was good enough for Everton to finish in the top 10. That's, that's not why people follow Everton. They follow Everton because they want Everton to win something. And they believe they can. And I think the club hasn't had the belief of the fans. And I think at this moment in time, they've got a winner sat in the dressing room in Ancelotti. And I think he's assembled a decent squad. And I think if it was me and I, and I was a chairman, I'd be looking to say, right, you've got to get us into Europe. And you've got to get us into Europe on a, on a regular basis. Because once we have that new ground and we can fill it and we're in Europe, we want to win the league within two or three seasons of being in that new ground if we can't win it before. Now, if we get that new ground and we fill it, then financially, we're in a better position to buy players. We're in a better position when people come and look at the ground to want to play there. If you're in Europe all the time, it attracts even more players. So I think the only way they can go by having a new ground was, is to be successful. And I think that's why I didn't want to leave Goodison. But I can see commercially why it makes sense. And also now I can see probably for the philosophy of the club, it makes sense because if we're going to move, let's not move and be a failure. Let's move and be a success. And 
you know as well as anybody else that the clubs don't survive on the gate money. They survive on the hospitality and all the other stuff that goes on around the ground. So if they can get that right and they can sell it out all the time, then I think you're looking at Everton winning the league within the next 10 years. We hope so. <laughs> well, there's no reason not to, is there? Yeah, we, 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 we had to be optimistic at some point because there was such uh, pessimism around the fans that at some point it just really got over the top and, you know, it didn't make sense anymore. Now we have well, a different panorama. But logically, yeah. if I put a lot of money into my football club, I don't want to see losers because right. I will stop my money in. And what happened before was the, the previous chairman didn't have the money to carry over. This man has come in and he's got billions. So he's a businessman and a, he's driving it as a business. So he's going to get success, whether it be with Antilotti or with the next man. He will get success because that's why he's plowing his money into there. The infrastructure is really good. You know, the new ground will be excellent. So the only thing logically that would ruin it is a poor team. This time he's made three great signings. Hopefully in January he might make another couple. And then in the summer, another couple. So by the time we get to the new ground, this team might be a different team again and full of world stars because we can afford it the more successful we get. And I think logically, if you look at it in the business as a business plan, then we're going to be successful because we can't afford not to be as a businessman we're in the club. So I think it's a really optimistic time for Evan. And that's what I say. As soon as they can win the first trophy, the better it is. That's right. Uh, let me go next. Here, Jean from Uba, Minas Gerais. He asks, how do you see our defensive system today like pros and cons and how important it is for a keeper to have a, a great back line uh, does the keeper's emotional aspect emotional yeah aspect sorry <laughs> is affected by uh, the performance of the other players what do you think well, first and foremost, as a goalkeeper, it doesn't matter who's in front of you. You still have to do your job. Yeah. It, it does help if they're better, because the better the players, the less you have to do, the more it's easier to communicate with them. So, at the moment, I think Everton are not the quickest at the back, and they hold, they hold a high line. Um and that's why I think it was really important that the midfield players protect the defence. But I think as a unit, you know, if Holgate comes in and, and Godfrey starts playing as well, Keane's OK, he may well go to three centre-halves eventually because they, they seem to have three decent ones. So And you've got, you've got Mina as well. So we, we've got four decent centre-halves. You know, we're going to have to use them sometimes away from home maybe where we go and play three and, and then, you know, two wing-backs. So it's given him a probably flexibility in defence, which we didn't have before, which I think is nice. Holgate is great on the ball. Godfrey, because he played at Norwich, will be comfortable on the ball. Keane and Mina, I don't think are comfortable on the ball at all. So that means your midfield players have to come and take the ball off them. So that means you have to have a ball, somebody who can pass in midfield to come and get the ball off them. But if you played Godfrey and Holgate, I don't think you'd need that because they, they can both play with the ball. So you can see where he's going. He wants everybody comfortable on the ball. And the other thing that he's done is inject some pace in the team. So the three people he brought in have, have got decent good engines where they can run up and down all day. So I think, you know, Keane's played well so far this season. And I, I think as a goalkeeper... He gives you a problem sometimes because he's so dominant in the air. So even if you want to come up for crosses and stuff, he get in your way because he does like going for the ball. So I think maybe Pickford's been told to stay in a little bit. So maybe that's why he doesn't come out as much as what I think he should sometimes. So, but I think they've each got their own merits. Um, 
they just need to play in the right combination. And I think Holgate and Keane's probably our best one at the moment. We'd have to have a look at Godfrey to see what he's like, but he looks like he's, he's quite quick and he's quite versatile, so he can play right back. So I think it looks quite good. You know, if we're playing at home, we can throw on another centre-back. If we're playing away and we're winning, we can throw on another centre-back. So I think he's got options all over the place. So I think defensively, I don't think we're too bad. I just think people got at us too easy last season because our midfield couldn't run. And that's the biggest problem we had. So you think it's more of a, of a, of, you know, us uh, getting away from, from last season's performance, right? So it's not, it's not really a problem of the squad itself, but the fact that the performances last season were so poor that we are still trying to, to figure out what's up with the players. Well, I think the players' attitude this season has been great. <clears throat> I, I think it has changed. And maybe getting rid of a few players has made them realise that they can get rid of a few people. And bringing the other three in has made it easier for people to play as well. And once you've got legs around a team, it makes it easier. You know, last year, they didn't look motivated. They didn't look as if they were interested. It looked as if there was a mishmash of so many styles And what you've got to remember is that all of them players are bought by different managers at times. Yeah. And that's not good. That's like having six jigsaw puzzles and trying to make one good one out of them. The pieces don't normally, you know, won't fit. And, that, and that's been all the manager's problems. Every manager that's come in has had the last lot. And in today's football, it's far easier to get players to sign for you than it is to get rid of players. Because from, wherever, from when they go from Everton, they don't go anywhere higher, do they? Because they're out of the team and they won't go anywhere higher, so they have to go lower. And because of their wages, they don't want them to go lower because they're going to have to take a pay cut to go lower. So a lot of them will just stick there and, and pick their money up. You can't blame them in one way, but in another way, you'd like them to be a bit more ambitious uh, and move on and play an awful long game. So I think... The problem these days is, like I say, getting rid of people and it's really difficult. And at the moment, I think it, we're still probably, I want to say, probably need to get rid of them probably another five and bring something better in. You know, when you look at this, the bench, you look at the bench, you go, right, who's going to come on and change the game? And on the bench, sometimes you go, going, well, I can't see much really because they're the same ones we had last season. There's no real something different on the bench so maybe we you know we, you're as good as what your bench is and at the moment we're doing exceptionally well what we've got on the, on the field <clears throat> but there'll come a time when we have a few injuries that we're going to have to really dig in and, and struggle through that patch unless it comes around January and we can buy you know but what you know you have noticed or I, I've noticed is that the players who weren't playing particularly well last year have come on And they've looked better again because everybody else is running about. So I, I think the attitude is going to make a massive difference. And I think the quality is making a difference. And I think getting rid of people makes a difference. But I do think that we have to get away from last year because the manager is a winner. And I think he wants to win. And I think sometimes you're an educator, you go into a class. And if the class is not interested in learning, no matter how hard you try some days, it just don't work. And it looks like we had more or less a half season of doing that last year. Wow, I'm, I'm here like, so many things opening up. So. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the picture for, for us as well. Um, we had, uh, we had, we, we even had trouble with uh, doing coverage of the season. And, Once the, the results are not coming and you're not, you're not enjoying watching your club, mm -hmm. you know, things, things get dried up really fast, you know? Yeah, well, there was no, nothing positive coming out, was there? And, I, and yeah. I think what you have to keep in mind, look, this, this season's not going to be perfect because we'll lose a few and we might get a few heavy, heavy defeats here and there. But the progress is being made. And what you need to keep in mind is that 
the big picture is is that things are building to when we go to the new ground. Ancelotti's building slowly. You know, he's not come in and thrown a billion pounds at the team. He's come in and he's looked and he's changed a few things. And I hope he'll change in a little bit in January and it'll be a slow build. So, yes, we have to be patient. But as a businessman, wouldn't you rather him take his time and make the right decisions rather than come and buy somebody just to get us through a season? And I think we're buying longer term now, which means that hopefully the players will be here longer and serve us better and have more loyalty to our club and make us more successful rather than what we have done in the past is buy a player because he's quite quick, but he's coming to the end of his career or he's quite quick, but he's not as good as what he should be. You know, Theo Walcock, in all fairness, couldn't get in the Arsenal team, but we bought him because he had a bit of pace. He was in and out at our place in the end. So really, that we've now had to get rid of him. But if we hadn't bought him in the first place, we'd have saved that money and maybe bought somebody decent instead of buying two people to see us through the season, buy one real good one that's going to make a difference to your team. So I think we've been, we've been like someone who's took over a house that's fallen down. We've just patched it up. And now this man is coming to strip it back and start again. And I think that's the best way to do it. Okay. Moving on. Um, Hardine from, or Rodney from Campinas, Sao Paulo. Hi, Nev. How are you doing? What's your view regarding uh, goalkeeping preparations or goalkeeping training, I believe? Because the, the quality of Pickford is undisputable, but sometimes it seems that he's losing those qualities he already had, and he's not improving in other basic... Um, basic aspects of goalkeeping. So, what can be done to improve it? Same as you do with your children when you teach them. You get them to sit down, listen, and then look at what they're doing. And I think for him, he doesn't need to do anything physical to change because his physical attributes are there. What he needs to do is just think And like I said to you, goalkeeping is all in the mind. It's not in your body because we can't move without our mind telling us or our brain telling us to move. So it's all in your, it's all in your head. So you, you have to be always self-analyzing everything you do. I used to work on three games. So I'd work on three games and try not to mistake, make a mistake in the three games because we're all going to make a mistake. And then on some days... On your good days, you make a mistake and someone clears it off the line. On your bad days, they go in. And I tried to make sure I just concentrate on a little block of three games. And then I did that all the way through the season. And hopefully I tried to work on, if I made three mistakes that cost me three goals a season, then I would also make saves that would get me them three, turn three games back. So I'd always be on an even. I might save us for three games. I might cost us for three games, depending on the, on the results. And that's how I work. But with, with Jordan, I think it's just self-evaluation. It's going home. And I sat down and I watched all the other sports because lots of other sports come into goalkeeping. I mean, I, I, watched, I watched golfers because of their concentration. You know, they, they concentrate for five hours. But between holes, they must have to switch off. You know, you look at volleyball players, which I know is big in Brazil the movement and the technique of volleyball players is very similar to goalkeepers. So you look at their movement, weightlifters, because you have to power yourself to the top corners, gymnasts, boxers, controlled aggression, but you also have to punch the ball. You know, boxers, again, what, what, how they become aggressive, but they keep it all confined and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? all in a box really so you never lose you you never lose you never become too aggressive you're always just there at the right at the right edge and I, and I think again tennis players because of the footwork and their concentration and what they do and how they live their lives so if you can look at a number of different things 
in other sports and try and pick up little things that give you an edge. Uh, but goalkeeper, you have to study to be a goalkeeper. You can't just be a goalkeeper. You have to live. You have to learn. And you have to sit down and be really honest with yourself and go, right, Saturday, what could I do Saturday? Yeah, that, that was rubbish, that was rubbish, that was rubbish. And then you say, right, why was it bad? Well, it was because this and this. Okay, so I'll learn. And then you always have to continually improve on what you're doing. The idea of a goalkeeper is to be a chameleon where nobody can see a weakness. And I think that's, for me, when they look at somebody, they go, right, okay, is he good on crosses? Is he good? Is he, yeah, he's okay all around me. Yeah, what's his weakness? Well, he's not that weak, so okay, we won't bother with that. You know, you look at Jordan now. If I was playing against Jordan now, Jordan Pickford, I would hang the ball first under the crossbar and then maybe have a nudge with him and have a little tussle and to see if he lost his temper, see if he lost his concentration. You would test him out and I think he does get tested out. And once the crowds come back, you know, he's going to get absolutely loads of stick. So at the moment for him, it's a mental battle, I think, rather than a physical battle. So I think sometimes the best goalkeeping coaching is like the best teaching. You sit down with a cup of tea or coffee and you have a chat and you let them tell you what they think the answers are and you just facilitate their learning, really. And that's, that's all you need to do with him. Sit down and work out how he thinks, listen to him and then just say the odd word here and there because I think he knows the answers. Maybe he just hasn't found the right key yet. So it's your job to just provide that little key for him. And have you got in touch with Jordan or, or even the coaches at the club? No, I think that would be extremely rude, extremely disrespectful. What makes, what makes me think I know better than what they do? Not exactly for, you know, like um, teaching them what they already do, but, you know, talking because you are our greatest goalkeeper. So your, your name itself means something more, but it's not exactly well, about a, a professional. Um, no, it's dispute. about mentoring somebody really, isn't it? It's about mentoring somebody, being there for someone to talk to, I think. Look, I know that I could sit down with him and have a conversation with him over a cup of tea and it would be better for him than doing two hours training. Because talking's better sometimes. Because you just... I always like to go and ask somebody what they think they're good at. And then you watch them train and you go, okay, sometimes they're right. 99% of the times they're wrong because that's not their strength. Their strength is something different. So I think Jordan's key is in Jordan's head. So no matter what training you do with Jordan, you have to get inside his head. And that's the key to Jordan, I think. is, And it's the key to most people, in all fairness. If, if they're going through a bad time, what are your options? Well, your options are you try even harder. And then sometimes, because you try so hard, you still make mistakes. So what I found worked for me was, I thought, well, I'm going to go out to enjoy it, because it's what I joined for, to enjoy the football. If I make a mistake, well, okay. I'll make a mistake. As long as it's an honest mistake, I don't mind. But I'll set out to enjoy it. And I won't try and do anything I don't have to do. And I think Jordan sometimes goes looking for things to do when he doesn't have to. So I think it's sometimes just sitting down and explaining them the little things to him and seeing what works best for him. Because I'm not Jordan Pickford and Jordan Pickford's not me. So we have to work out what kind of personality he's got, how he thinks, and work out what's best for him. Because again, he's, he looks like he's smaller than me. So he might have slightly different problems than I do. Because again, if I'm six foot five and he's, he's six foot, he's gonna have, he, we're both going to have different problems. So we approach it differently. You know, if you're an educator, that everybody's unique and you have to find that little thing that makes them tick. And that's all it is about coaching. It's, it's, the drills are fantastic. The coaching's fantastic. But it's no good if it doesn't go in his head. So football should be played in your head as well as your heart. But your head first. Your heart will carry you through, but you need to think about it first. Okay, so that 
that clarifies a lot about about the goalkeeping situation. We had we had too many questions about Pickford as well. Is he? Uh, by the way, as as we are still talking about him, so what are you thinking about this whole witch hunt uh, towards Pickford? Oh, because he's he shouldn't have done that. He should go to jail, and people are threatening him now on on social media. So so as you are in the UK, um, how, what's your point of view about this post drama? Post Merseyside Derby drama that's going on. Well, right I now. think, I think, I put on Twitter before the game on Saturday that I thought the media were out to get Jordan Pickford anyway. And to be fair, and and Liverpool's goalkeeper as well, they were waiting for them to make a mistake. So we're, they were never going to judge them both fairly, never ever, because there seems to be you get an England team as a goalkeeper. And they love you. And then once they turn on you, they want you out. Because Henderson looks like he's he, he's the one that they want in at the moment. So he was always going to get lots and lots of stick. The tackle he did was a rash tackle. Um, but I've done them. Everyone does them. It was a red card, probably, yes. Did he mean to injure him? No, I don't think he meant to injure him at all. Not not to do what he did. I think he just, again, that little bang, flash, slightly lost concentration, boom, collides with him. And I, and I think if it had been any other game, maybe he would have got sent off. But I think the pull derby saved him from getting sent off. I think once it's been judged offside, they judge the other bit as, well... You know, it's it's not in the game. Probably should have been. He should have been sent off, and that's what it is. But as for the social media stuff, what you've got to remember on Twitter is that most people go on Twitter late at night after a few drinks, and they say the most ridiculous things in the world. So I don't think you'll take much notice of that. Um, death threats. I've had death threats. You know, it's just the way it is, isn't it? Um, but it's being fueled by the media. He hasn't done himself any favours with the tackle. Maybe he should have come on the, the television after the game and apologised um, in front of the cameras. And I think that would have, you know, I think that would have gone some way to to calm everything down. I do think, what what can you do? I mean, how many times can he say sorry? You know, it's funny that they picked on Pickford and Richarlison's tackle was bad. It was a bad tackle. It was just a mad tackle that he just flew in. He just he looked to me as if he just went, well, I've had enough of this. Oh, boom, done. And not much is made of that. It's all, it's all about Pickford. And I'm thinking, why is it all about Jordan Pickford? Because he hasn't had a great season. Well, you know, everyone makes mistakes, don't they? Look, I don't think he's going to in, try and injure that player. There's no nobody does. There's, well, so in our day they did, they did it. And I've seen a few of uh, your Boca Juniors games and all of them, and, and all the South American games where the tackles around your neck. So <laughs> yes, yeah. But but things it have happens. changed. And things have changed, and they, you know, especially in England, where you know it looks outrageous as a tackle. Um, but there's no crowd. It's quite sanitised. I, I just think that the the media have a, a vendetta against Jordan Pickford at the moment. I don't think that's fair. You know, like I say, though, when you're having a, a bad time, in as much as he makes a few mistakes, then that's another mistake, really, that he did. I can honestly say I've been in his position. I've done exactly the same thing. I thought, ah, shit, I'm just going to get the, I'm going to get either them or I'm going to get the ball because he ain't scoring. So whatever I get, if he scores, then I'm going to splatter him and that's just the way it is. But that was then. Now you, you can't, you know, if you sneeze by somebody and they fall over, you get a yellow card. So, you know, it was a, it was a bad tackle. It should have been a red card, but that should be the end of it. You know, it's not his fault that the referee didn't do anything. It's not his fault that VAR didn't do anything. 
you know, he's not going to put himself in prison. He's going to he's going to go out and play on Saturday, and you can guarantee that the ref will be watching out for him. Guarantee that. So, is he going to get a fair hearing on, on Saturday? No. Will, will will the media be looking for him to do something? Yes. So he's already loaded the gun against his head on Saturday. And that's what you don't really want to do when you're having a, a not great time. You want to be trying to take the pressure off you. So again, it, you know, I like the way Ancelotti's handled it. He hasn't come out and said anything. Much, he's going to play Jordan on Saturday because he's his best goalie. And I think that's a good thing. But you can guarantee on Saturday, somewhere in that, in that Premier League, there'll be another mad incident and all the media will go on to that. So really, it was just a case of sitting and waiting out this week out until, until something else mad happens on Saturday or before. And then everything will be back to normal. But it is particularly nasty um, at the moment on social media. And it's not nice. By the way, is there a vendetta against Everton? Because it, it kind of feels like... Um, Not, not actually from today, but there has been some minor uh, digs at Everton at some points, like uh, Everton broke the transfer window or Everton are a dirty club, things like that. Uh, and, and it's, it's fueled now with, with the, the whole incident at, at the Merseyside Derby. So is, is there any, any, any uh, malice towards Everton from sports media? I, I don't think so, in all fairness. What I do think is that they've not got much to write about because the football's that bad at times. I think they're looking for things to write. And because Man United really never spent billions and nobody spent massive and massive money, they were looking for something to write about. And because Everton spent a few, a few pounds, they... I don't. I don't think they they like Everton being Everton. I think they like their fashionable clubs. I think they like their Arsenal's and Spurs and Liverpool's and Chelsea's because you know London clubs always seem to get better better media attention. Um, it, it was the same when you know when we won the league and stuff like that. It was still the same thing. So not much has changed really. I think I'd be using that if I was sat in the Everton dressing room saying, "Look." Um, These people, it'd be great if we can win the league or we win a trophy. They'll be absolutely devastated, the media, if we win a trophy. And it'll be, it'll be nice to use that as a motivation to go and win some of them. But in general, you know, Jamie Carragher supports Everton. So he ain't going to say much. And to be fair, he stuck up for John Pickford on Saturday. Otherwise. So, yeah, but I know he used to watch us. Yeah. Well, he, well, he's a red now. He was a blue, so there's always that little bit of blue in his heart. So, you know, he's, he's, he seems to be a, a, a fair fella. Um, so, look, well, let's be honest. What food do you eat in Brazil that's wrapped up in newspaper? Oops, sorry. Can you speak again, please? Yeah. What food do you eat in Brazil that's wrapped up in newspaper? So we have fish and chips over here. You know what fish and chips are? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's like a typical yeah. food. Um, yeah. Up in newspaper. I, I don't know. Uh, it's because fish and chips are something you eat in the morning, right? No, no, we eat. My, Is it the lunch? Uh, uh, tea, evening meal. Oh, you can have uh, lunch. As, you can have yeah. lunch, but they're wrapped in fish and chips. Of That's where all the meat. Like yeah. we have. We have different, uh, different uh, standard meals. Like for breakfast, it's usually uh, bread and butter and coffee. And yeah. for lunch, rice and beans and meat. And okay. I think so maybe much my, my best example then. What I'm trying to say to you is where the media belong is wrapping your fish and chips up. Uh, and that's... Okay. That's it. You don't need to bother about the media. You, whatever they've got, they've got their own agendas. And you must have newspapers who are really pro-government over yours. Yeah. And there must be newspapers who are anti-government. Well, at, at the moment, 
the media are anti Everton, not not because of anything really, just because they're not as fashionable as the other clubs in their eyes. So, but where where the media belongs is in the bin. That's right. Uh, let's continue, and we have three more questions. Okay, if there's not a problem yep. with you. Um, Adalto Santiago, he's from Fortaleza, Ceará. He wants to know a little more about your, your story with Everton and specifically the, the Great Escape from 94. So can you tell us uh, a little more about this period at the club and the roller coaster of emotions you probably went through that period as well? Well, I think we had our, our style of play was we rolled the ball out to the centre halves, and they had ten passes, fifteen passes. We, then they passed the ball to Vinnie Samways, who then did another thirty passes, and then the opposition took the ball off them and scored against us. And we were getting beat at home because of the style of play, because we weren't good enough to play the style of play. Vinny was good enough and his family was good enough, but the rest of us weren't good enough to play that passing game. So we always kept getting caught and we kept getting beat. And wherever we went, and wherever we got beat, the manager, Mike Walker, used to say we weren't fit enough. Which is a strange thing to say, considering you're in charge of the team. So what he basically was saying was, you're not fit enough because I haven't done my job properly. Well, that's not a real good thing to say to a group of lads. So we should never have been in the position we were in. Uh, coming to the last day, <clears throat> I can't remember anything of any team talk ever that Mike Walker said to us, ever. Not even that day. Um, we went out onto the pitch and it was basically us versus them because the manager was non-existent, really. I never thought we were going to lose. Never, ever thought I was going to lose. Um, nearly got to take a penalty. Which I which would have done because you can only either score or miss. So it's a 50 50 for me. And after the game, everyone went really excited and berserk and was kicking the bins and, and, and jumping around the dressing room. And I was sat there drinking my tea thinking, this is a disgrace because we should never have been in this position. And, and while it was a victory, it was also a massive point to say, how did we get in this position? How come we had to survive by one game? How come we were this bad? How come the club has fallen this, this far down? And, and really, you look at the recruitment, and, and the recruitment's been everything to Everton ever since then, really. <clears throat> and I think when you look at the last four managers we had, the recruitment now getting this one has been the right recruitment. I think the ones before, <clears throat> excuse me, happen and I think the perfect example for me is when Sam Allardyce came in and told us he was going to save us from relegation Yeah, but we were never going to get relegated not in a million years so if he'd have come in and said I'm going to get you into Europe I'd have been delighted but he went the opposite way and, and it became negative and, I, and everyone bought into oh all of a sudden we're going to get relegated <coughs> We were never going to get relegated. And I think that's the difference when the wrong person comes in at the wrong time and you have negativity rather than positivity. And I think this is what's anti has changed is that it's now become positivity rather than negativity. And I, and I think if you're having a football club, surely you should expect to win trophies. You should expect to be competing for, for everything. And when you're not, it's right to say that it's wrong. And I think in the past we've settled for for rubbish and too much negativity. And now I think because of the new ground, the new owner, a new manager, I think everything's a more positive place. And I think most people now would expect Everton to win at Southampton on Saturday. They always expect it. Now, whereas before, they would never know about the result. Now we're top of the league, everyone expects them to win. And I think that's a great position to be in. And that's how it should be. You should never come over to Goodison Park and wonder what the score is going to be 
and not expect Everton to win because I think there's no reason for you to come if that's the case. You come and you should expect to win. And I think now it's a bit better. In the future, it's going to be better again. Next question. So, um, getting from this point of the Great Escape, going backwards, Yuri Medeiros, he's from Campina Grande, Paraíba. Um, Everton, uh, after the glory days of the 80s and mid 90s, uh, became stagnant. And the club had some, oh my God, even better. Uh, the club had alternated some moments of good and poor football. Um, and I think you kind of you kind of answered that a little bit. But why do you think uh, why do you think Everton um, showed this oscillation between good spells, bad spells? And do you think these this this sort of periods, this sort of alternation, is coming to an end? Well, I think the reason they had up and down seasons is because of recruitment, pure and simple. You know, when you have to, David Moyes brought a bit of stability, but David Moyes' style was was okay for a time. And then when he couldn't get what he wanted to get, he became negative. And I think that then it started to show in the performances. Um, and then the recruitment after that really was up and down. You know, they'd come in and they'd have a bright start, then fade. And it seemed to be that the players that we were buying were either short-term fixes or not good enough. And I think if you buy short-term or you buy the wrong people, then you're sometimes going to have good days and sometimes going to have bad days. You know, you're, look, you're always, as a club, looking for consistency. But if you haven't got it in your manager and your philosophy, then you're not going to have it on the pitch. And I think now we're looking at a world-class manager who wants to win trophies with a, an owner who's really ambitious with a new ground. So I think the philosophy is quite clear now with that we're building a squad to get into that ground and to win the league and to try and win a trophy as soon as we can. So I think, you know, it's like anything else. You, you get the best people for the job. And we're not in a situation at the moment where we're down the bottom of the league, so we need to recruit somebody short term. We're top of the league. We're not going to go down this season. And we're planning for the future. It's a totally different thing than when David Moyes was there because we only had a certain amount of money. And when you have a certain amount of money, you can only buy in it. You can only go to the market. You can't go to the supermarket. Or you can't go to the, the really expensive shops to, to, to buy your players from. So you have to make do with what you've got. And if you pay us if you pay a certain amount of money for a player, then he's not going to be world class. So he's going to be relatively inconsistent. Even though he could be a good Premier League player, he won't be as consistent as a great Premier League player. And I think we bought too many who were good, honest Premier League players, but with nothing special. And they couldn't do anything special. They were just good, professional people. And I think while we're sort of a bit consistent, we always hit bad periods where things didn't go well. And that's because they didn't have the, the extra bit to get us out of it. And now at the moment, we've got Rodriguez, we've got Richarlison, we've got Bernard when he, when he gets himself ready, of people who can do different things. And that's the big key for Everton is, is having somebody that can do something different. And I think we've got that now and, and hopefully we'll buy a little bit more. And I think, you know, the future's really, really good for us. But everything, whatever job you go, it's about recruitment. If you recruit the, recruit the right person, then you've got a chance of success. If you try and get four not bad people who might do the job, then you're always going to struggle. So this time they've gone out for a proven winner with a proven track record with a, an ambitious uh, owner. And I think that's, that's really good for the club. And as a fan, it's got to be really good for the fan because you can look forward to 
better times. Yes, there will be some bumps in the road, but there will be some really good times, I think, as well. Last question. So, it's not actually a question, but Everton Caetano. I don't know if you noticed, but Everton is a very common male name here in Brazil. So, a lot of people started following Everton because of the name of the club. Right. So, so yeah. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. <laughs> yeah, so, there are lots of Everton's here. What, 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 what does Everton mean in English then? If it's Portuguese, I take it you all speak in there, does it? Yeah. Is it Portuguese? Portuguese. Yeah. So, so what does Everton mean? Is it equivalent to our David or our John? What does it mean? No, it, it, it's like a, it's like a proper name, like like Neville, right. you know. Right. right. A first name. So we don't know the origin. Actually, we're not sure if it's if it's because of the club, or right. or if there's another origin. And now we have Everton. Caetano, he's from Minas Gerais, which is uh, the, the, the birth state of Bernard. It's the place where he was right. born. And he, he asks you to talk a little more about uh, the Holy Trinity. So did you actually watch the Holy Trinity play? You know, Kendall, Val, Harvey. What can uh, you tell us have... about them? Well, I can tell you that Howard was a great player and a, and a gentleman. Colin Harvey was the grumpiest, baddest loser I've ever met in my life, <laughs> who was a top player. And Alan Ball was just like a fireball. Energy everywhere, a great player, never stopped. Fantastic enthusiasm. So when you look at the three personalities... It must have been really hard to play against them because they were absolutely top class. And luckily enough, I, I, I met all three. Obviously, Colin and Howard were at the club when I got there. You know, and Colin was a reserve team manager for a while before he moved up to the first team. And if you played tiddlywinks or you played any game with Colin and you beat him, he wouldn't speak to you for a while. <laughs> Whatever it was, he just wouldn't. And, and I think that, that showed on the pitch because he, his attitude rubbed off on the players as well, because nobody wanted to lose. And, you know, some of the five sides went on for ages because he didn't want to lose. So it was the difference between having Howard and Colin, everybody picked him on the five side team. When Mike Walker came, nobody picked him. Wow. They didn't even want him to play. Jesus. And then when you have a, a manager, they all normally cheat to get their own way. Nobody will pick him. And that's, when you look at that, you're thinking, like, that's a statement on its own. Because he'd say, well, I'll go on your team. And they go, no, we don't want you. And he said, right, I'll go on this team. And they go, no, we don't want you. So we ended up a lot of the time just watching on the sidelines. With Howard and Colin, always joined in, one each side, and would just be incredible com competitors, really. So they were brilliant. And uh, when I met Alan Bowl, he was fantastic. Could talk nothing about for all day about football, blah, blah, going on and on and on. Really enthusiastic. You know, we'd have if you were still if you were there for you thought we were going to be there for ten minutes, you were there for an hour. But what he said was great, and uh, and uh, I think he was just fantastic. The three of them together were just unbelievable talent. And if you could make your own holy trinity, with or without you, but with your former teammates, who would you pick and why? Oh, Kevin Sheedy. Yeah, the birthday Because Kevin boy. Sheedy could do things that not, none of the other people in the squads could do because his left foot was better than anybody else's and he could score goals and deliver set pieces and passes better than everybody else. So I think we could replace every one of the team with somebody, but for him because you couldn't get anybody else with his quality. I think Peter Reid, because he was just ultra competitive. He wouldn't know when he was beaten. He'd play. He didn't mind getting hurt. He didn't mind hurting people. He could play. Uh, he was just a fantastic competitor. So I always knew if I had them two in the team, we'd always have a chance of winning. And probably I would go for the other one in... Andy Gray, because again, I knew that 
he didn't mind heading somebody's head as long as the ball went in the back of the net. He was just com completely crazy, man. So you knew if you were ever in a fight, he'd be the first one there. If they wanted to play football, great. But in the main, that nobody, no centre-half we ever played against didn't come off without some sort of bruise from Andy. No goalie ever came off without a bruise from Andy. He was just an incredible competitor. But again, he could play, he'd score loads of goals. He was the bravest man I've seen. He didn't mind getting kicked in the face as long as he scored. So I think them three, competitive-wise, I don't think many people would get past them. Well, if they did, they'd be on their hands and knees crawling. That's a perfect trio. Wow. Uh, Nev, thanks for having us once again. Uh, we're delighted to talk to you for for this amount of time, and we hope we can catch up soon. Even you know, face to face, it would be even better. And, yeah, be nice. And please, and you know uh, what? Be nice. Next time you do one of these, make sure all the other people are on as well. Yeah, we're gonna try making it live. Uh, it's, that was our first idea, but well, we couldn't really schedule that in right. in a time that it would be more accessible for people to watch so, yeah. so what time is it there now right now it's 3 26 p.m in the afternoon i'll take yeah. it yeah yeah so okay. this is still a uh, work time for most people so all uh, right okay so that's why we we chose to to record it and it's even uh, uh, a new experience for us as well because we we are not video makers, so we we had this system of doing live stream, but we're we're going to figure out how to edit some things and and then we're going to upload it later. Well, ne next time, uh, do you go on Twitter? You go on Twitter, don't you? Yeah. Right. Well, go to the former players. Try to and talk to them. them. Things. Ask them to do it. Ask them to send to you, ask them if you want some other players to come on. Some former yes, I'd players. Love to. Really shitty. Well, it would be great. Well, ask them. Ask the former players. That's, you know, it doesn't cost you anything, does it? It doesn't cost me anything apart from half an hour's time, an hour's time. But then you can make it maybe a little bit later and you can have it after work. With people, and you might be able to. What I was thinking about was for you was to try and get everybody in one room, so you could put one on the screen and have a microphone at your end. Yeah, and do, do it like that. Rather, you know, when you if you all meet somewhere, and do it where you meet and have a drink at night. That, because yeah. open mic. I mean? and do, yeah, and and do it like that. That will, I think that would be quite fun. Yeah, it, it would be. And if you if you got in touch with Brazilian fans, it will be even funnier because we can be fun. Trust me. Yeah, I know. I've seen. Yeah, I, I remember playing for Everton against. I can't remember the name of the team, but I knew they were from Brazil. We played a tournament in Switzerland pre-season. Wow. And, and they, I, I can't remember who they were, but they brought all their dancing girls and they brought all their thing, the supporters with them, and it, it was it was great. It was great, and it was only a pre-season friendly, and it was brilliant. But I always remember that. I played against Brazil twice for Wales, and we've never lost, which is good. Wow. Oh. Yeah, which is a yeah, 100% record, which I'm extremely proud of. Who wins? Uh, no, uh, I think two draws, I think. Oh. So that, that was quite good. 1-1, uh, one, one, I think, and nil nil. I think. Oh, yeah, it was, it was good. End of the season game, so... So, and I I like the way the Brazil, Brazil play football um, and I like I like I like the way you leave your lives because you don't have too many hang-ups do you you don't worry about too much stuff do you we do but it's kind of like we learn how but you do it in the sunshine yeah how, how not to go over the top so that's an issue as well yeah so yeah but you know Whenever I look at I look at Brazil, I always think it's it's one of them countries that whatever happens at the top, the people get on with stuff. 
and they live their lives the way they want to live it and they suffer the government. So Nav, uh, thank you very much. If you, if you please, uh, can, can you give us a final shout out for where everyone is going to watch this interview? Yeah. Uh, what do you want me to say along the lines of, look, I'm, I'm extremely honored to be interviewed by you and your Brazilian fans. I'm really grateful that you're, you're all Evertonians. It would be really nice next time I come on here that every one of you has changed your name to Everton. <laughs> I think that would be good. And look, I've really enjoyed the night and I, and I really like your questions. But keep supporting Everton because the good times are around the corner. That's right. Thank you very much, Big Nev. So, Thank I'm going to stop recording here.